Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox, or CART for short. My name is Ariel Ligi, and I'm CART's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator based out of the University of Arizona in Tucson. Carly Jewell from Fish and Wildlife Service Science Applications is here with me today and will be helping run this webinar. For those of you who are new to CART, CART supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars, workshops, and tool development. These activities support communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, the restoration of aquatic ecosystems, control of non-native aquatic species, drought, climate adaptation, and fire. Today, we will be hearing from Laura Van Riper, who will present about Roger, as well as John Tull, who will join her for the presentation. We will follow the presentation by Laura and John with a QA and a um, where they will answer questions from the audience and propose questions for discussion for webinar participants. We encourage you to please write any questions directly in the chat, and we'll keep track of these questions for the panelists to answer after their presentations. Laura has over 25 years of academic and on-the-ground experience in collaborative, community-based natural resource management and conflict resolution, both within the United States and abroad. Laura has a master's and PhD in forestry with an emphasis in natural, natural resource sociology from the University of Montana, Missoula. In addition to her work with Roger, Laura works with the BLM's Collaborative Action and Dispute Resolution Program. John has been dedicated to protecting native species of plants and animals throughout his career. His academic work focused on focuses on measuring impacts of human activities on wildlife through a variety of research activities. In his current position at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, John facilitates partnerships and collaborations to advance science for the conservation and management of native wildlife species and their habitat in the Great Basin region. And with that, I'll pass it along to Laura. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I'm still dealing with allergies. It's like the never ending allergy season this year. So excuse me if I sound a little froggy. So John and I are gonna talk today a bit about collaborative adaptive management and the co-production of knowledge. And we're gonna use the results oriented grazing for ecological resilience or Roger collaborative group as a case study. And I'm gonna give a broad overview of the group. And although, um, Roger doesn't focus specifically on wildfire and cheatgrass. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into that portion of the group's work because I think it might be um, most relevant to some of you guys. Oh, now my slides aren't advancing. You can try um, the little, there's sometimes little buttons on the screen itself on the bottom left if you have i got no buttons no buttons i don't know why oh there we go there it is i don't know my computer might be <laughs> having a lag all right so i'm going to start off with just some um background and context kind of some of the overarching themes that were prevalent in nevada in 2015 so given the contentious atmosphere that characterized public land management in nevada so think the bundy's bunkerville the argenta grass march uh, BLM headquarters and the state director initiated the Stakeholder Engagement for Healthy Lands project in 2015 in an effort to work more closely and transparently with stakeholders and staff to build relationships and networks that improve the health of the land and communities. And so as a first step in this process, I led a situation assessment and visited face to face with over 175 diverse individuals across Nevada, northern Nevada in January of 2015. The intent was to listen to their perspectives, concerns, and suggestions for how to work together to develop and advance common goals related to maintaining or improving riparian and rangeland health in Nevada. Um, a report was developed and sent to all the participants as well as made publicly available. Some of the concerns that were raised during the situation assessment included grazing in NEPA. So Nevada has a large backlog of grazing permit minerals. You know, the current uh, BLM and I believe Forest Service regulations uh, state that uh, term permits need to be renewed every 10 years. However, many are outdated or have never been fully processed. Um, and so in a lot of places where grazing plans exist, 
Uh, permittees are locked into poor grazing regimes. They're either undermanaged or overmanaged. And just to put this in a little bit of context, um, there are 680 total BLM grazing permits in Nevada, and about 580 of them are FLIPMA permits, which means every 10 years they're just sort of <clears throat> carried over. Um, without you know, conducting land health evaluations or modifying permits or, or whatnot. So it's not the best um, situation. Many permittees and the BLM have wanted to or have been trying to update their grazing permits and management plans, including you know, developing rangeland improvement projects, changing dates and season of use. They've been trying to uh, make that happen for years or even decades because they recognize the need for flexibility and adaptability to effectively respond to changing resource conditions like drought, invasives, fire, et cetera. Um, but they've been kind of hamstrung by the NEPA workload and the litigation that, that often follows. Another uh, uh, concern that was raised during the situation assessment at that time in 2015 was that there was considerable fear and uncertainty about the potential sage grass listing and what that would mean for Nevada. Um, there was a sense that the plans, both the Forest Service and the BLM sage grass plans that were rolled out in the fall of 2015 kind of undermined some of the long-term locally led collaborative efforts that had been in place and damaged relationships. There was also a fear that um, BLM and potential litigants would glom onto some of the habitat uh, requirements in Table 2-2 and expect to see them everywhere, even though they're not necessarily able to occur everywhere. So there was some concern there. There was also concern about the monitoring methods that were required in the plan, specifically the assessment uh, inventory and monitoring aim work um, that was required by the BLM. It was very costly. There was concern that it would be unlikely to be continued over time, given past experience with BLM monitoring efforts. There was concern that the information is difficult to scale up and down in order to inform management and determine trends at the landscape allotment and the pasture scale in real time. And the information is difficult to display easily in a way that you know, cre helps create a common understanding about what's going on in the landscape. There was also concern that increasing regulatory burden on public lands grazing would have unintended negative consequences for sage grouse habitat on uh, private land. And then last, there was concern about the ability of BLM to actually successfully implement the needed changes in a timely and effective way. Even if the plans kind of seem to imply a certain level of protection, there was just concern about how the interpretation, how the plans were rolled out, and whether they would be implemented consistently across the agency. There was also concerns about the wildfire cheatgrass cycle. Uh, numerous scientists, agency specialists, permittees, and others expressed concern over the wildfire cheatgrass cycle. Um, and uh, in order to try to get ahead of that, there was some interest in exploring options for using targeted grazing to create fire breaks using prescribed outcome-based grazing to manage cheatgrass expansion and improve perennial grass health. There was a desire to replace the traditional automatic two-year post-fire grazing closures with opportunities to experiment with strategic post-burn grazing to improve seeding success. There was interest in strategically using native and non-native seed mixes uh, to create green strips and other uh, things uh, related to fire rehab. And then lastly, there was a desire to more effectively engage rural communities and particularly ranchers in fire suppression activities. And then last, the relationships between the various parties and organizations and particularly between ranchers and agencies were poor in 2015. They were characterized by a lack of trust, limited communication and coordination, and relatively few opportunities for collaborative problem solving between those who affect and are affected by resource management decisions. So the Roger Group, the Results-Oriented Grazing for Ecological Resilience, uh, was formed in uh, January of 2016 to try to address some of these challenges. And just as a side note, um, the Roger Group is a rancher-led collaborative, and the ranchers felt like if they were going to be dealing quite a bit with various agencies, they needed to have a good acronym, and hence uh, Roger uh, was created. 
So like I said, in January of 2019, a group of Nevada ranchers with a proven track record of ecologically sound management across millions of acres of public and private lands in sage grouse habitat came together with various federal and state agency leaders and staff and other partners to try to kind of pave the way, experiment and take risks to help develop new tools or to navigate pathways through existing bureaucratic processes for the benefit of sagebrush ecosystems and ranching. And I've been facilitating that group since their second meeting in April of 2016. So like I said, Roger's a large uh, rancher-led collaborative that works on multiple scales. There are over 200 people on the group's mailing list and about 50 people participate um, regularly in one to two day quarterly meetings and field tours. Roger has a steering committee that includes um, two to three ranchers, the BLM Nevada State Director, the Fish and Wildlife Service Region 8 Field Supervisor, and the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest um, Supervisor. Essentially, Roger is kind of a bridging organization that occupies a space between policy, science, and management to facilitate trust and relationship building, learning, um, conflict resolution, and knowledge co-production with the goal, ultimately, of collective action. Roger functions as a, I call it interest-based or it could be issue-based collaborative that's focused on experimenting with place-based projects to develop adaptive solutions that achieve land management objectives to conserve sagebrush ecosystems and support ranching within Nevada and the Great Basin. The group was originally focused on um, Northern Nevada ranchers with much of the emphasis being in Elko County to begin with. But today the group includes ranchers from all across Nevada and members from other uh, Great Basin states, as well as folks from various BLM field districts, state and national office offices, in addition to you know, a diverse array of partners. Um, this is just a list of some of the partners to give you a feel for uh, the breadth and diversity of the group. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, switch gears and move a little bit into uh, Roger's ongoing efforts and accomplishments. So historically, there have been four main focus areas, outcome-based grazing, adaptive management planning, assessment and monitoring, and wildfire and invasive species management. I'm gonna go into each of these in a little bit more depth. Um, in terms of accomplishments regarding outcome-based grazing, uh, Roger has been instrumental in the development and expansion of the BLM national outcome-based grazing demos. Four out of the 10 demos are in Nevada and three of those are in Roger plus one from Oregon. All the permits have been completed and the focus now is on um, implementation. Uh, adaptive management planning, five Roger ranchers worked with University of Nevada, Reno, BLM, Forest Service, and NRCS under the Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Grant to explore the effectiveness of the grazing response index, which really looks at grazing timing, intensity, distribution, and plant recovery as a planning tool for meeting rangeland health objectives. The focus now is on sharing that information through trainings and technical bulletins and a number of, um, or a few, I should say, grazing plants have been experimenting with and incorporating um, GRI as a tool for planning. John, I'm gonna kick it to you to talk a little bit about the Roger Science team and their focus on assessment and monitoring. Thanks, Lauren. Good morning, everybody. Um, so the the science team uh, was an offshoot of of Roger. Early on, my involvement was um, originally as a, as an employee of the Nevada Department of Wildlife before I came over to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And when I joined Fish and Wildlife Service in the Science Applications Program, um, I was really interested in in have, you know applying a technical lens to this collaborative group and finding ways to both identify science gaps and then um, fill those gaps with research opportunities. So uh, after a couple of years of, of really good conversation, we honed in on, on some needs at one of our field tours, specifically thinking about remote sensing tools and the data sets available and how we might be able to apply those to ground-based management needs. Uh, prescriptive level uh, decision making and, and potentially uh, you know, improving the permitting process for BLM and, and, and perhaps the Forest Service as well. So 
we pulled together rangeland ecologists and wildlife ecologists to you know to what had traditionally been very separate camps in the conversations um, we recognized that we needed to have both of these science disciplines working together on these issues rather than you know coming at it from very specific specific perspectives and, and being combative in in both the science literature and in a lot of the conversations that would occur particularly the technical conversations so um, we put together a team of researchers with funding that was from the fish and wildlife service and the blm and focused on several of our outcome-based uh, grazing demonstration sites as our study areas. The majority of the work has really been in the wine cup gamble, but we've got another ecological site uh, that's more Southern Great Basin, much drier that is a comparison site as well that uh, data sets have been developed and evolving for this project. So next slide, Laura. Some of the key outcomes to date are that um, there's a comprehensive database. Laura mentioned the AIM data sets, the BLM um, uh, vegetation monitoring that they've done. Uh, there are also state equivalent data sets, Nevada Department of Wildlife. Uh, they collect their own vegetation monitoring. They use the same protocols. There are many research teams that also collect data from uh, the rangeland ecology side of things, as well as the wildlife ecologists. And so those compatible data sets have been included. So we have this very uh, comprehensive database that is um, the foundation for um, the majority of everything that's built off of that within this research project. So that was the first step. Um, and it's an ongoing um, database that incorporates uh, new data as it's made available. Um, we're also uh, you've been able to look at those field-based measurements and um, have some really good interaction between the PIs to improve the mapping, the, the land cover mapping. Uh, as many of you know, if you've used um, the rangeland um, assessment platform or uh, RC map, which is a USGS similar tool, those those platforms are, are great at getting a large uh, picture idea of what the landscape looks like, uh, but they require or they rely on these fractional estimates within each pixel, these 30 meter pixels, 30 meter by 30 meter pixels to basically characterize what that spot on the ground looks like. So if you start to pixel peep, if you really look at each pixel, you're going to find errors and problems. And uh, sometimes those problems accumulate and become problems that are more than just a one pixel problem. They become a landscape scale problem. And we've made a lot of strides in, in uh, being able to improve the quality of those through these efforts, these focused ground-based efforts. Um, there's also been the incorporation of uh, GPS collaring on cows as well as wild horses to really uh, help us understand what, what types of use on the ground is occurring from our grazing uh, uh, ungulates, both uh, managed and unmanaged, and how they associate with vegetation conditions or ecological sites within uh, the landscapes of interest. Uh, so just we found out that these disturbance response groups, which are a subset of uh, ecological or a, a grouping of ecological site descriptions that have common characteristics, that those serve as really good predictors across the landscape of uh, where um, not just cows and horses are going to go, but also sage grouse, where they, they tend to want to be during various timing or portions of the season. Um, so the, the really the main goal, though, for this project is to come up with this grazing management tool. And we just recently had a co-production co meeting that was, I think, quite successful, where we've been able to showcase some early prototyping of the tool, had some great discussion and conversation with, with uh, quite a few uh, ranchers in the room, as well as our agency management folks. And so we're in the process of, of refining that and, and looking towards a, a version one release towards the end of this year. Um, and the value of this grazing management tool is, is both for land management agencies and ideally being something that they may be able to incorporate in their uh, permitting processes, uh, but also for ranchers or other land users to be able to explore the ground and think about um, how 
uh, land uses, whether it's grazing or other things are affecting the vegetation conditions on the ground. Next slide. And this is just a, a screen grab of, of the prototype of the grazing management tool. Um, and basically, you can see that we're able to use this Landsat archive of remote sensing data to come up with these time series changes. You can see that in the right there with the various colors. Um, those represent different uh, vegetation uh, groupings and how they've changed over time. So I won't go into any more detail on this, but just a chance to show show you a little bit of what we're doing. Thanks, John. All right, so moving into wildfire and invasive species management, I'm going to talk about three um, separate efforts here. So the first one um, is one of the outcome-based grazing demos is focused specifically on cheatgrass management. The hot, uh, Horseshoe Scott Gulch allotment is located outside of Battle Mountain, Nevada, and is owned and operated by Nevada Gold Mine. Uh, grazing managers here are using cattle to target and manage invasive annual grasses while restoring deep-rooted perennials at the same time. Both of these allotments have been severely impacted by wildfire over the last 20 years, which has led to a dominance of cheatgrass and other invasive annual plants in both allotments and a reduction of native perennial grasses and shrubs. So the purpose is to renew a grazing, was, because it's been renewed, renew a grazing permit that facilitates flexible and effective grazing management to target cheatgrass at the appropriate times of the year to assist in control of invasives and increase desirable plant species in the, in the area. So if given the choice, cows don't often select for uh, invasive annual glasses when grazing. Um, using flexibilities from outcome-based grazing Partners are able to use cows to target cheatgrass earlier in the season when the grass is younger and more palatable. They are also looking at seeding of uh, non-natives to establish perennial grasses back into the, the ecosystem. The intent is to get the landscape in better condition today than it what has been in the past, which will not only improve forage and wildlife habitat, but will also essentially create a 40,000 acre green strip to protect intact sage grouse habitat from future fires. So John talked a little bit about ecological sites, site description and ecological sites are areas that have similar climate and soils and produce similar kinds of and amounts of vegetation and are repeatable across um, the landscape in terms of how they behave in uh, response to disturbance. And so we're able to group those ecological sites into what John talked about as disturbance response groups which means basically their response to the disturbance is the same. And um, we, the, this, this outcome-based grazing plan in particular draws heavily upon state and transition models, which exist for all the different ecological sites and the disturbance response groups. And they basically provide a, a visual and written description of the dominant plant communities, the mechanisms that cause change between states and the, and the various restoration pathways. And so in short, it, it really provides a way to explain ecological causes and rationale for adaptive management and, that, and the recognition that ecological dynamics on a given piece of ground shift due to a variety of factors, and we should in turn manage those landscapes differently. For management purposes, both of the allotments have been divided into existing states um, with a large percentage of these areas in the annual state or the cheatgrass monoculture. And so for the annual states, the objective is to manage for cheatgrass with flexible dates and AUMs and set targets for levels of use. Once the annual state moves to another state, likely through seeding as the restoration pathway, the grazing management and monitoring will change or adapt to reflect the needs and objectives of the new state. A key component of outcome-based grazing demos is the emphasis on cooperation and communication between the permittee, land management agencies, research scientists, and others during the development, implementation, monitoring, and adaptive management process, and recognizing the critical role that permittees play um, in success. So in terms of monitoring and adaptive management, the permittee will do annual monitoring, like utilization, production, um, use of remote sensing to develop cover maps and dry residual matter. 
Um, and BLM will focus on landscape level monitoring with a re by doing a repeat of AIM every five years. They also have annual operating meetings to review the results of implementation and the short and long-term effectiveness monitoring and then adjust as needed. And then there's also ongoing experimentation with the research community using remote sensing in addition to on the ground data to, to uh, help make grazing management changes quickly and to continue research into the state and transition models and the various restoration pathways and get a better sense of what can actually happen in a reasonable time frame. So for instance, is it reasonable to go for an annual state to a non-native perennial state to a native perennial state in say 20 years or 30 years, or I'm just trying to get a better sense of what's realistic on the landscape. Okay, another effort um, is the targeted, the BLM National Target Grazing for Fine Fuel Reduction Demo. Uh, there are currently two Roger ranchers that have been successfully implementing the first demo since 2018. Um, the Elko District initiated targeted grazing fuel breaks within three different areas as part of ongoing efforts to use livestock as a tool to reduce highly flammable cheatgrass within a strategic area to reduce the stress threat of large scale rangeland fires in sage grouse habitat. So the, air, the plan was for the areas to be grazed in the spring when cheatgrass is green and highly palatable. Um, and so that would help reduce the amount of available fuel to burn once it dries out. Uh, great, under the targeted grazing demo, grazing management is meant to be adaptive and cattle grazing is altered as needed using all kinds of tools like temporary fencing, herding, water hall supplements um, and whatnot. In terms of monitoring and adaptive management, the USDA Agricultural Research Service um, has designed and implemented a rigorous monitoring protocol for each demo. They collect pre and post grazing data from replicated studies um, at each location and they coordinate with the district and the permittee and then they also share this information more broadly. They've, there's a number of papers in publication and I know they've done a number of presentations at SRM and other places. In terms of adaptive management, so in the first year in 2018, um, the demos didn't, the demo in Nevada didn't um, meet fuel height reduction targets for a variety of reasons. The spring weather patterns, the grazing was initiated late. There was large amounts of cheatgrass that had carried over from 2017. And so in response to this, the TS Ranch applied dormant season grazing to reduce the standing residue in the winter of 2018, 2019, which proved promising. And has and so since then, all the various targeted grazing demos have been updated to allow for the implementation of dormant season in addition to spring grazing um, on all the different uh, uh, demos, which a lot of people early on was concerned that we were only focused on spring grazing in the first place. Since the implementation of the fuel breaks, there have been three instances where wildfires have intersected these targeted grazing areas, all occurring uh, within the 8,000 plus TS ranch fuel break, or 8,000 acre plus, sorry, TS ranch fuel break in 2019, which is what these photos are of. Um, they, the fire was stopped at uh, 1,029 acres off of, the fire had started off the I-80 corridor and was held at a, a, a little bit over 1,000 acres. In 2020, another fire started and was held at 55 acres. And in 2021, there was a third that was held at 41. And so in each of those instances, the targeted grazing fuel break helped firefighters in suppressing and containing the wildfires and avoiding, you know, uh, larger blowups, basically. Okay, so last thing I want to talk about a little is um, the Martin fire, which occurred in 2018, which, and it was the largest fire in Nevada history at 440,000 acres. Because relationships were built and discussions uh, and the development of a common understanding and vision on some critical, you know, post-fire uh, rehabilitation topics, had occurred as part of Roger well before the quote unquote crisis. Um, when the Martin fire occurred, the, the east side of the Martin fire was able to quickly organize a, a coordination team or a work group of 15 to 20 various uh, agency folks, permittees, researchers, and other partners um, to think through 
how to develop an uh, emergency stabilization and rehabilitation plan that, that maybe was a little bit more innovative and strategic than they have been in the past. This plan, again, was informed by ecological site descriptions and the disturbance response groups, as we've talked about, and it allowed for a more thoughtful and detailed um, planning process and use of resources. And so what this is a big map that I'm not going to go through, but one of the thing that was, you know, to, by understanding the disturbance response groups and how pathways would happen and the various ecological sites and what they can and can't be um, going forward, um, we were able to think through things like, uh, for instance, on the right side of the screen, there's that dark green strip, which was uh, a decision to create a one mile wide uh, crested wheatgrass reseeding to kind of serve as a green strip to help stop the encroachment of tree grass into areas, you know, that didn't actually have it before. Um, in looking up more towards the north, there was a lot more perennial grass cover and less shrub cover. And so it was thought that it wouldn't burn as hot there, another fire if it came through, and that the native grasses would be able to recover naturally. And so, you know, rather than looking at like, broadcasting crested wheatgrass seedings everywhere. It was really purposeful um, in terms of where they were gonna be. And then the last thing, you know, uh, with the BLM, typically when ESNR and uh, plants happen and reseeding happens, there's an automatic two-year grazing closure. Um, there was concern about that. And the thought was that, well, if we were maybe a little bit more strategic and created strategic grazing agreements, um, and the, the group used an I, uh, template from the BLM in Idaho that we could not only just help combat cheatgrass, but also help uh, some of the preferred species establish and thrive. And so that was put into place in the spring of 2019. So in terms of monitoring, you know, there's both implementation and effectiveness monitoring. And, uh, you know, there's kind of a rough start there uh, in terms of implementation monitoring or did we we do what we said we were going to do. We were the district was able to complete the herbicide treatments and the aerial seeding, but we they weren't able to do the drill plan drill seeding for green strip because we had funding issues. The government shut down, um, and then we had weather related issues. And so in 2019, there was a field trip as well as aerial monitoring done to look at you know what had happened, what the outcomes were, and um, what they found was that uh, the herbicide treatments that were applied to control cheatgrass were very effective, even though they were not able to complete the drill seeding. However, what they found was that the vegetation regrowth in areas that were moderate, moderately or severely burned had um, been very mineral, minimal. And so you had these huge areas of, of like blowing dust basically. Um, and it was found that that was happening all over um, the fire, the, the fire scar, basically. And so there was a switch in priorities based on that uh, information. And the, it, switched, it shifted away from looking at that one mile wide green strip. And instead, it turned to focusing on the severely burned sites and creating little, you know, smaller green strips. So the severely monitorly moderately burned sites are the blue and purple on the, the updated map to the right. And you see those little green areas that were gonna be um, the green strips. So always changing conditions, you know, you gotta stay on your toes pretty much. Um, so the last thing I wanna talk about really briefly is um, how Roger has sustained this partnership long-term. So I don't know why this picture is flipped. I'm having a picture flipping problem, but, um, Regardless, you get the the, the gist. Um, like most collaborative groups, Roger spent about two years early on, you know, from 2016 to 2018, working through these various stages of group development and often kind of spinning in one for a long time. But we did eventually, uh, you know, reach agreement on purpose, function, organization, you know, the various action items and things we were going to undertake and, and what success would look like and began performing as a group. And again, like I said, uh, Roger focuses, functions more as an interest-based collaborative with subgroups or working groups looking at specific 
experimenting with specific place-based um, projects and then bringing that information back to the larger group. In 2020, um, we were focused on maintaining and expanding the group as well as evaluating impacts and determining the future direction. And so we were lucky enough to receive about $100,000 in 2020 from BLM Fish and Wildlife Service and the Intermountain West Joint Venture to hire a coordinator through their SAGE capacity initiative to help uh, manage the Roger group. And we also decided that we were going to undertake an evaluation, you know, not, not a super researchy evaluation, but we tried our best. It's hard to get ex people excited about evaluation. Uh, but we felt like it was important four years in to take stock of, you know, where the group has come and, and how they want to move forward. And so John Tall actually introduced us to um, this partnership impact model, which we use as an evaluation framework. And so I'm not going to go deep into the results of the evaluation, but I did want to spend a minute and just tell you guys a little bit about this model because I, we found it to be super helpful. And so um, basically uh, it outlines 11 impacts that landscape stewardship partnerships sh should consider when it comes to delivering, measuring, evaluating, and communicating the value of their collaborative initiatives. Um, the complete, you can get the complete evaluation guide and additional information at that uh, link in blue. The 11 partnership impacts are gr grouped into foundational, operational, um, and outcome impacts. Another way of looking at this, uh, the different impact categories is in relationship to the different phases of a partnership's life cycle. It's, it really helps as a, the partnership impact model is really helpful as a tool to help scale up and sustain impact throughout the startup phase, the building phase, and then the man maintaining and um, sustaining phases of a partnership. So um, like many other collaborative groups, the COVID separation negatively affected Roger and you know, the switch to virtual meetings for years. Um, because Roger had such a strong foundation and underpinning, you know, behind it, I think the group was the group was able to weather that, but it definitely um, uh, moved us from what we thought we were in a maintaining and sustaining phase, and it really moved us back into kind of a rebuilding phase. And so we took a step back in April 22, which was the first meeting we were able to have back in person following COVID. We reconvened for two days and revisited the group's purpose, function, and structure. And um, using the results from the partnership impact model, started to think through um, a, a future core, you know, how we were going to organize and, and what we were going to focus on in the future. This sent, set a solid foundation moving forward because, and it's important because Roger continues to expand both its membership. Um, and it's focused onto things like now we're moving into riparian and lahat and cutthroat trout recovery. We're going to be having a nexus with the Forest Service um, wildfire crisis strategy. And I imagine we're going to be uh, heavily involved in the two, at, at least the two VLM focal landscapes in Nevada, you know, that were established under maybe their restoration landscapes now. I forget what they're called, but we're established under uh, Bill and, and Ira. And then um, we also just recently, like last month, were able to get another 185,000 from IWJV, BLM, Forest Service, and Fish and Wildlife Service to extend that coordinator position for another three to five years. And the hope is that over time, I'll be able to step away as the facilitator and the coordinator will be able to take on both the coordination, dealing with a lot of logistics, as well as a more active role in facilitating the group. So I just wanted to leave you with this quote because I love it. Um, and then I will open it up for uh, questions. And I put um, both of our contact information there in case you want to reach out with us, reach out to us after as well. All right, thanks. Sorry, I know there was a lot. Thanks, Laura, Laura, and thanks, John. These were uh, there's a ton of information in this presentation. We're going to be sure to 
pull out some of those resources and put them in a webinar summary so that folks can reference them in the future. I feel like there's a lot of really inform informative stuff and resources that people and collaboratives um, across the Southwest could use. I was thinking a lot about the different collaborative groups here and how there are, <clears throat> pardon me, are a ton of parallels um, and, and similar threats that folks are facing and also a lot of novel approaches that Roger has used that could be transferred to, to here. So um, I haven't seen any questions rolling through the chat, but I'm just gonna take a moment and invite anybody who's on the call today to just unmute, ask any questions um, to, to John and Laura or questions of each other, comments. Um, I feel like there's a lot to, to discuss and I'll just give a moment for, for people to jump on in. While people are talking, I was just looking at the chat and I didn't realize that you had a case study about the Martin Fire Post seating. So that's awesome. I'll have to go check that out. Yeah. Share it with the Roger group. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to. We've been trying to um, coordinate with them to, to update that case study with some of the results and how it's turned out. And I was really excited to see you share some of those results uh, in this presentation. So yeah, pending. Uh, Pending capacity, we're going to sort of continue to update those. We really love being able to follow up with some of those case studies to show the results over time. Yeah, definitely. If I can help at all, just let me know. Will do. While we're waiting on people, and please interrupt me, anybody, if you have a question, but I was just going to comment on the Lahontan Cutthroat Trout Project, too. And um, I serve as a technical advisor kind of in that process as well, but much more of a of a um, from behind role than, than, than lead role on that other research effort. And uh, my colleague here in the Reno office is involved with that um, as the Lohan Cutthroat Trout Recovery Coordinator. Um, but there's a lot of similarities there because they too are looking at remote sensing approaches to try and come up with um, better classification of stream quality and habitats for LCT. And, and so, you know, as, as we get, um, this first round project in an early phase of completion for, for kind of the grazing management tool, we plan to, in the future, incorporate those riparian components and have, you know, something that hopefully is a more holistic view and approach that allows us to think about multiple factors, because we really are building uh, much of the grazing management tool off of our um, our research expertise on sage grouse, but we don't want it to be a single species focus. It's not intended to be that. Somebody had something in the chat. Yeah, I see a question from Jackie. And so did the partnership impact model create any changes in the research or future plans? Um, yeah, so I, like I said, I didn't, I have a whole nother presentation that I can uh, send to you guys if you want, it's recorded. It talks through the evaluation outcomes, but one of the what there was two big things that come to mind. One was that the group wanted to continue to expand, right, to continue to build its network and and leverage resources and whatnot. But there was this there's this dynamic tension between getting very big and being able to uh, be a, a manageable size so that stuff can happen. And when we have 200 plus people on the mailing list, you know, yeah, we get 50 people every quarter, but it's not always the same 50 people. And so there's always a lot, you know, figuring out how to manage that, how we're going to like kind of onboard people, how we're going to keep information sharing going so that people can be brought up to speed so we don't have to go back every time we get new people. Um, in the room, that was one of the things we we worked on um, quite a bit. And then the other thing was there was a concern that we were, you know, we were doing a lot of these individual projects or demos or, you know, individual experimentation, but we hadn't gotten to a place where, you know, that's not fast enough, basically, let's say it that way, right? These challenges that are facing the sagebrush ecosystem, we cannot meet them by doing one project here, one project there. And so um, I wouldn't say that the Roger Group per se has done this, but BLM and some of the other agencies that are part of the Roger Group and from hearing some of these conversations and concerns have really been trying to move the needle, you know, and, and moving outside of these demos to more like, okay, how are we gonna incorporate the ability for flexibility um, within grazing permits at a larger scale. 
or how are we gonna deal with wildfire at a larger scale? Or how are we gonna look at restoration or focal landscapes so we're not single species focused where we can actually have some strategic versus kind of random acts of conservation across the landscape? I would say those are some of the biggest things that came out of the, the partnership impact model results. Yeah, and, and Laura, do you recall was accountability one of the things that came up because people are having these conversations? There's it, it does force people to report back on success, failure, or lack of effort. And I think just that that's in front of folks. It helps um, make sure that the things continue to to progress or. If not, then figuring out why they're not progressing in terms of um, whether it's management decision making or on the ground or whatever. So, so Matt had asked about long term monitoring um, on the fire rehab. I wasn't personally involved with the rehab project. I, I, I know that BLM does, you know, they're monitoring within these post fire restoration areas, and I'm sure. Um, that Indals uh, got their teams of folks out there as well, but I don't know the specifics of that. Related to the, you know, the remote sensing tool, the grazing management tool, um, and and just other approaches for looking at um, our remote sensing data, we can, you know, see the landscape scale changes over time. Uh, recently, there was the sagebrush conservation design, which uh, is a biome-wide look at the ecological integrity and its vegetation-based, um, and that's another way that, at least at the larger scale, we can keep an eye on the recovery of, of that landscape and, and some signaling, I think, is already coming through about improvements, um, but specific on-the-ground monitoring, I'm not very familiar with that. Yeah, to update the uh, story map that you guys have, you'll that would be Endow or the local BLM office would would know what they've been doing in terms of monitoring. In terms of whether there was a focus on soil restoration, um, again, not directly involved. I'm kind of high level, Roger. I'm not intimately involved in all these efforts, but. My understanding is there wasn't a huge focus on soil restoration. But there, you know, it was on soil mate like stabilization, ke keeping the soil on the ground instead of allowing it to blow in these huge dust clouds was the was the number one priority. Um, so stabilizing the soil was key. And then um, this won't answer the soil question, but I did think it was interesting that there's a lot of ongoing research happening with University of Nevada Reno and others looking at seed coating and you know various perennials and and how that will work within different ecological sites and um so and of course soil is the foundation for the development of all those ecological sites so soil is hugely important but specific restoration activities related to soil I'm I'm not aware of post Martin fire So the kosher question, that, that one doesn't surprise me that it came up, but yes, it was purposely uh, seeded in areas and that gets directly back to that soil, soil stabilization. So there's a lot of these high sun exposure, lower elevation sites that are um, at very high risk of cheatgrass conversion or, or were predominantly cheatgrass prior to the fire. And so um, there's a, a mix of, um, of purposes for putting kosher in. One is for stabilizing those uh, soils, um, also getting some sort of placeholders that um, do allow some transition over time into other perennial grasses and other species. They do mixed seeding. They don't do, just do kosher. Um, but also the kosher provides a very important winter forage for uh, mule deer. Uh, and a lot of the, the low elevation kosher sites were um, key wintering areas for, for mule deer. So in a, a year like we had this past year where the snow really pushes them down into lower elevations, that becomes their, um, their primary food source. And so it's a quick response forage for um, post-fire that maintains some other resource values on the landscape. 
And no, it's not a toxic invasive, it's not considered a toxic invasive weed. It's not classified as, as such. It wouldn't be allowed in a seed mix if it were a state invasive weed. <clears throat> and just that conversation that John had with you right now was the kinds of conversations that we had when I said we were having lots of discussions and trying to create a common understanding of Roger prior to the crisis. I mean, there's a lot of opinions and perspectives and concerns about native versus non-native seed seeding and reseeding and how we're going to do this and why and what are the trade-offs and benefits and risks and so a lot of those conversations were had you know in calm settings so that uh when the fire happened and they have what three weeks to turn around a plan on how they're or less on how they're going to rehabilitate this area we weren't having the contested you know, co critical conversations about native or non-native seeding because we never would have got we never would have got through those right then and there. Yeah, and I think I think across the board, everybody would um, be very happy to to do fully native seeding if we had the availability of it. We just don't. There's the marketplace for native seeds is a, is an ongoing process that's being developed. I'm involved with other um, collaborative groups in Nevada to really try and promote that. Um, and, and there are others who are the leaders with the Nevada Native Seed Strategy and, and other um, uh, groups of folks that are really moving the needle. There's a science component figuring out what works and where it works. Um, there's a component in figuring out how we can grow up quantities of seeds and which seeds um, and so it's it's a long game, but we're all invested in that. And, and if we if we had something we could could successfully place that wasn't uh, non-native, we absolutely would. We just do not have those options in place right now. We've still got time for a couple questions and. Um... If anybody's got something on their mind and wants to try to articulate it aloud, I feel feel free to unmute and jump right on in. Um, yeah. Thanks, Ariel. This is Dan Ginter from New Mexico, and I'm as a land manager. I'm I'm just curious. Did you find that there was a I'm keep the word hunger kind of comes to mind, but a hunger for this kind of collaboration? with the folks that you're dealing with and how did that manifest itself and how did you guys you know move that forward well I'm kind of laughing because when we first started in Nevada there was a hunger for fighting <laughs> but I think um yes people were uh you know the the fight had gotten to such an extreme in Nevada that I think people were realizing it was like that is not the way to go. That's not, this isn't helping us collectively. We really need to be putting our energy, resources, time, attention on, on, on things uh, that are more productive. And so, yes, there was a hunger, but there also was um, kind of a trepidation about it. Um, but I think once we, once you know, you started to bring people together, um, that changed, that, that trepid, you know, the first meeting was kind of bumpy. There was definitely, I mean, it wasn't like all of a sudden we brought people into room and everything was rosy because that's not how it, how it went down there. It was very bumpy for, for a while. And, you know, subgroups were continuing to kind of fight behind the scenes, but overall, um, there was more willingness to work together than to continue fighting it out. And I would say now it is, it is palpable. It's it, there, you know, the difference is palpable. Um, heck, if we don't put people in a circle to have conversations, they start to get upset. You know, if they, if they're in a meeting and they're auditorium style and people are talking to them and that's not even fighting, that's just, you know, they don't like that anymore. So I feel like we definitely have changed um, some of the culture. Um, in the state in particular. And even though this has been happening in a lot of other states, Nevada was kind of, you know, we had a couple of, 
I think the longest standing collaborative in, in Nevada, it's about 25 years old now, and it was the um, oh, Cottonwood, uh, oh, Shoe Soul, the Shoe Soul Group, sorry, I was forget the name. And then they had the Stewardship Alliance of Northeast Elko County that started for a while, but, but um, it's, it hasn't been as much, collaboration hasn't been as uh, you know, regular as an approach in Nevada as it has been in some other Western states. So there was definitely a little bit of a learning curve there. And the other thing I will say, well, I got a second is, we also, based on that situation assessment, you know, we didn't jump right into collaboration. We started with conflict management. So we actually, so what we found was there was, you know, there was Bunkerville, the Argenta situation was happening. There were a couple other ones that were potentially, you know, explosive and kind of sucking all the air and attention out of the room. Like even some of the most collaborative, innovative, awesome people we're lining up in the, you know, taking sides, which is just not normally how they would be. But it really was kind of, um, like I said, taking a lot of the air out of the room. And so before we could start to kind of work on this end of the uh, bell curve, you know, we had to deal with keeping the various uh, conflicts from exploding. So we kind of worked on both both ends, but we definitely started with the the conflict um, and, end of things. And there was a lot of trust building required. And and so the very first meeting we had was a total total disaster. We didn't have a Laura Van Riper in the room to help us figure it out. And and I was a participant in the crowd, not not running it, but but would have probably done the same thing. And so. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service showed up and 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 brought in photos of good grazing, bad grazing, and just would put some photos up. And and um, no trust had been built. People didn't have relationships in place. And you can imagine that nobody could agree on anything, whether a good, really beautiful site was actually good or a really, you know, apparently bad looking site was actually bad. And it took us a while to to get our feet underneath ourselves and then recognizing the importance of not trying to rush into like you know making decisions or judgments but forming that group for quite some time 